please greet our speaker, Lily. So I'm gonna do a little bit of walking around, but um, I do need the clicker if I'm gonna do that. And I think I left it up here. Special shout out to our tech support tonight. <laughs> I know firsthand how difficult it is to do online and in person and a conglomerate of technology needs. So I'm going to talk about biomimicry, what it is, how we can practice it, and also harnessing your own experience in plants and plant knowledge, what you can do to start learning and practicing biomimicry, because I think that's really important. Um, can I get a show of hands if you've heard the term biomimicry before? Ooh, cool. All right, so to start off a little bit about me, um, thanks to my mom for bringing me here and doing that lovely introduction. I think she instilled a really early on love for plants and playing in the garden and going outside in the springtime. We would every spring drive this rickety trailer and our Toyota Land Cruiser down to the desert and chase wildflowers and look for certain species. And we'd have the big plant books with us. So I think that early on really instilled an appreciation for and love of the natural world and the beauty and brilliance of the natural world. So I did get my undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz. And during that time, I went to a really incredible conference called Bioneers, which if you haven't been, you need to go. It's one of the coolest places on earth. I've been every year since, and it is the most inspiring place to be and just kind of a, a refill of hope and inspiration every year. It's been online for a few years now, but I think they're restarting um, in person this year. So I went to that conference as a fresh sophomore, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had it earlier this year. I forgot. In person. And you went. Yay. <laughs> yes, Viners is amazing. Um, keynote speakers were incredible. And the year I went, they had a keynote speaker that was talking about green chemistry and biomimicry and really got me thinking about at this time in my life where I was pretty depressed and frustrated with the, the state of climate chaos and climate change and the feeling of kind of hopelessness that comes with that, especially as a young person early on in college, I was learning all of this and getting exposed to it, but feeling pretty helpless in the sense of like, what can I as an individual do? Or in the bigger picture, it, it was just daunting. It was very overwhelming. And so hearing about this field and actually about a, a group of high school students that were participating in this biomimicry design challenge. And they had created um, and prototyped and come up with this idea for a self-refrigeration unit inspired by insect thermoregulation. Didn't require any energy. It was based on some chemistry and it was able to keep stuff cold for a few days, which doesn't seem like a big deal in the scheme of things, but it was able to help transport vaccines to really rural areas in just under stable conditions or preserve mother's breast milk in really rural areas where otherwise they'd be unable to preserve it. And so this kind of light bulb went off where I realized in this hopelessness feeling, all of the solutions we need are actually already out there and have been tested for millions of years in the natural world. The solutions are out there and we just need to be able to tune into that and start to listen and understand on a deeper level what was working out in nature and how we can translate it to our own design and our own systems and our own technology. And so I came back to Santa Cruz. I applied to teach a class in biomimicry as an undergrad, which was a really cool program that's pretty unique. I got accepted. So I spent one semester creating coursework and lesson plans and a syllabus for a course on biomimicry and the next semester teaching other undergrads. So I had about 16 students. We went, we spent a lot of time in the RS. Got very inspired about teaching biomimicry and introducing new folks to biomimicry or practicing um, that field. Me, the job at the Biomimicry Center a few years later when I was in the master's program. And the woman who started the master's program, who was a leader in this field, called me up and when I was in Oakland, and she said, I am trying to start an undergrad program at ASU and I just did your thesis. Do you want to move to Phoenix? And I, you know, instinct opportunity. She's incredible. This isn't my passion. And so I moved to Phoenix a few months later and successfully helped launch one of the first undergraduate programs in biomimicry in the world, which was super cool. We got a bunch of new students involved. We got faculty involved. And I have been working in the higher education realm now for a few years and have really seen first how siloed 
a lot of departments are. And one of the extra beautiful things, incredible field that integrates all of these and weaves together all of these different fields beautifully, which we we'll to a little bit later. So I worked at the Biomimicry Center and I launched that program. And then a few years later, I decided to do something else. And so last year, me and my partner moved to Denver. I and create coursework in the higher education. So I'm now teaching at Pratt. Um, I have a, a podcast and I'm doing a lot of kind of consulting based stuff with education models everywhere and nonprofits like the Biomimicry Institute who are working more in the K through 12 realm. And they have a lot of incredible resources that I will introduce later. So that's a little bit about me and how I got into this space and this really unique kind of intersection and why I'm so passionate about this field. And I love talking to people about this field, especially folks who have specific interests like botany and plants and gardening who are, you know, in the dirt a lot of the time, playing with plants and understanding how they work and why they function, which we're gonna get into later. Taking it a step beyond just learning about what that species is and how we can learn from that species and translate it to our own design. I also wanna do a land acknowledgement. We are on Moekma, Ohlone and Ramatush people's traditional and territorial spaces. And I think that's really important because um, native peoples and indigenous folks everywhere are the first practitioners of biomimicry. They've been learning from nature and understanding nature's rhythms and in relationship with the plants and animals and fungus and their brothers and sisters in the mountains and forever, forever millennia. Um, and I think it's not as acknowledged in the biomimicry realm, but it is a pretty new field in academia only in the last 30 years have we really started to see it in education, traditional and uh, formal education spaces like universities. And I think being in the university system for a few years, I really saw that firsthand. It is an emerging field, like my mom mentioned earlier. Only in the last 30 years has it been documented in academia and people are doing research on it and publishing research in this field. But we have been learning from nature since we've been human. So that's just something I wanted to acknowledge. So. A lot of you actually already know what biomimicry is, so I'll kind of whiz through a few of these slides, but biomimicry is ultimately learning from nature and applying it to our own designs. And this is a really classic example that, you know, we, we say to everybody, this uh, German engineer was walking his dog in the forest and came back home and his dog was covered in seeds that were very firmly attached to his fur. And as he was pulling them out, he was trying to figure out what made them so sticky. He looked at it under a microscope and saw these hook and loop systems and invented a, a long invention cycle, but he ultimately invented Velcro, what we know as Velcro today. And that was about a hundred years ago. So it's one of the first innovations inspired by nature, a very classic example of biomimicry. But I would honestly say this is not true biomimicry. And I'll get into a little bit of that, but um, do I have any guesses of like why it's not like real biomimicry? What could be better about Velcro to make it more life friendly, right? It's a petroleum product. It's shipped all the way around the world on transportation using fossil fuels. We use it a lot and it's a really great kind of face for biomimicry, but something that I wanna get into today that I talk about a lot in my lectures and the workshops I do is that biomimicry is ultimately innovation inspired by nature that results in life friendly design. I'm not saying that Velcro is a bad design, but it's not ultimately creating conditions conducive to life, you know, like that seed was, or like some of the innovations we can see today. So pushing beyond just looking at nature and mimicking form or what something looks like, or what we want something to look like, like architecture that looks like a beautiful leaf, but does it actually capture energy from the sun and direct water and help create structural integrity? Maybe, maybe not. And so that's where I want us to start digging deeper into this realm of biomimicry. It's becoming more and more popular. We're seeing a lot of media headlines. We're seeing a lot of research put out in the field. And somebody that's, you know, as somebody that's in the field, I really wanna push back and say, you know, is this really deep intentional biomimicry? Is it creating conditions conducive to life? Because that's ultimately what everything else in nature is doing. We wanna be able to mimic that deeply. And in order to understand biomimicry, I'm gonna give some examples on the biomimicry continuum. And this is a game. I want us all to play this game with me. I like being interactive in these lectures and not just you know, classic standing up at the, the lectern lecturing out to people, but I want your input. I want questions. I wanna have a conversation. And so this is an opportunity to do that. I'm gonna show some photos. 
And I'm going to say, is this biomimicry or not? Given your very limited understanding so far, what I've been talking about, um, we have all of these bio words now, like bio utilized, bio inspired, biomorphic. And I'm just going to go through a few of these slides. Even if you have no idea what I'm talking about, take a guess, and we're just going to have fun together. Biomimicry or not? <laughs> You've all seen these, right? They look like trees, they are hidden cell phone towers. Um, no, <laughs> we would call this biomorphic, right? It looks like uh, the morphology of a tree and it's sure it's aesthetically pleasing. I'd rather have this, I guess, in a neighborhood than a big wire cell phone tower, um, but that is not biomimicry. Taking a step further, is this biomimicry? This is that famous um, walking path in Singapore, I believe, that again, looks like tree and does have some path-like capabilities. Um, so this is a bit of a trick question, biomimicry or not? Yeah, I think it would depend on some situations, like maybe for structural integrity, if those, if the top was collecting water, which I don't think it is, or somehow harnessing energy from the sun, there could be biomimicry elements, but this I would say is also biomorphic. So it looks like nature, doesn't function like nature. This is a really cool example. This is packaging that is similar to styrofoam in its material essence. And Ikea actually just signed on with this company that's using mushrooms in to package materials. Would this be biomimicry? <laughs> this would be biounutilized. So this is using nature in a design. If it was understanding how the mycelium worked and communicated and then translating those learnings to some sort of system that we have, that would be more biomimicry. But this is using something directly in nature in something that we create. Again, none of these are necessarily or inherently bad. I don't think there's like a, a very clear distinction of good versus bad. They're on this continuum and we can work towards creating conditions conducive to life with all of these. And I, I just wanna make sure that that's a, a, a side note in all of this. But yes, Ikea just signed on to do a bunch of this in their new packaging, which I'm very excited about because it is way, way better than styrofoam, which literally never biodegrades. It will just break into smaller and smaller pieces and end up in every part of the ecosystem before it actually completely biodegrades. Yes, you can put it in your garden. <laughs> I don't think there's spores for fungus in them, but that could be a future innovation because I love growing mushrooms. Get this packaging, use it, put it in your garden, you get some mushrooms. A couple months later, you should patent that. <laughs> okay, this is a cool one. There's engineers that are creating spider silk and they're using bacteria that are genetically engineered to like create that material for them. I kind of gave it away, but biomimicry or not. <laughs> I'm getting some yeses. <laughs> this is another example of bio utilized and I forget the company's name. So I'm gonna look at my notes and they're like really, really quick, but I think it's spin tech and it's really difficult to mimic spider silk. We haven't actually figured it out, but if we accurately mimicked what the spider was doing, which is a few proteins and they have a bunch of spinnerets in their you know, abdomen that, that spin out, like I think it's eight different kinds of silk depending on the needs that they have. If we actually truly mimicked that process and didn't use bacteria that were genetically modified to do it for us, that would be biomimicry. In this sense, it's biounutilized. They're using something in nature to create a product, which again, isn't necessarily bad, but there's a spectrum of, does that become, yeah, manipulative and extractive, which is what we're trying to get away from. It's what we have been doing since the industrial revolution and what we really need to change and why biomimicry is a really important part of this revolutionary new way of thinking. It, old way of thinking, I should say. Oh, wait. Ooh. Okay, well, <laughs> this is a co cool company called Ecovative, and they're building bricks that are assisted with different bacterial functions, and they eat waste products and create this material that can be formed into a brick. And it's really innovative. It's carbon capture technology because they're, you know, consuming these waste products. They're capturing the stuff and then creating a material with it. And it's incredible, but again, it's kind of using and nature is assisting with that process. Um, and it, it couldn't include some biomimicry, but for this case, this would be bio-assisted. Only a few more. This is a pretty classic one, robotic arm inspired by the elephant trunk. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> Um, this, is, this is getting to the point of there's a lot of bio words out there. 
biorobotics is a subsect of biomimicry to the extent that there's some really cool robotics coming out that are inspired by how nature moves. We have a very robotic way of moving literally in robotics when they, you know, it's not soft movements a lot of the time, very right angles instead of curves and spirals. And nature does it really well with ligaments and tendons in a really incredible, easy, efficient way. So biorobotics is super promising and it's definitely part of the biomimicry conversation. On the other end of that, there are fighter jets inspired by how peregrine falcons dive. And I would definitely say that is not biomimicry because it is not con creating conditions conducive to life, right? So there's, there's conversation that needs to happen around what is biomimicry. And I think that's why it can be a little tricky sometimes to really be able to talk about it and be able to practice it. And that's why I wanna kind of get into a little bit more specifics today. Okay, last few. This is a really cool one and one of my favorites. Um, the lotus leaf, which I'm sure many of you have seen, is super hydrophobic, right? It repels water really well. All those water droplets falling up on it are because of the surface structure. And when water drops fall on the leaf and with a little bit of wind or the wave from the water it's sitting on, it rolls off and collects all the dirt on its way down. It's what we call self-cleaning. And so this company created a, a material that's inspired by lotus leaf and it's, you know, it's nanostructure, it's microstructure is similar to the, to the lotus leaf. And it also is a paint that can be applied. And then when it's dried, it creates a microstructure that then you have, you know, you, you can use way less water to clean commercial buildings or whatever it is. So it does create conditions conducive to life. Is this biomimicry? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so there's a few different realms of biomimicry. We have early on form focused, and that's the easiest kind of entryway to biomimicry. It's looking at how the surface structure of lotus leaf is physically repelling water and how we can mimic that surface structure. Again, form focused, kind of easy to see, easy to understand, and easy to mimic to a certain degree. We have really hard time with nanotechnology and being able to like 3D print nanostructures is something that I think when that happens, biomimicry will really take off because stuff in nature, plants in nature, do a lot of their things, their strategies with nanostructures that again, are, are really hard to mimic. So we can get into that later. Another example, oh yeah. Yeah, and that's another question too, is like how do the products that we design that are inspired by nature fit into the systems that already exist? And that's why I think we don't see a lot of biomimicry designs out in the market that are truly biomimicry. Um, and I, I push back on that a lot because yeah, it's a disruptive industry. And until a lot of these systems of manufacturing where we're getting our materials to make products like this, how we're transporting them, how we're distributing them, what the labor looks like, all of that needs to be part of the conversation. And that's why biomimicry, I think, has had a really hard time taking off in the, in the product development stages because it requires disrupting a lot of these industries. And yeah, there's issues with a lot of this um, I forget the name of the paint, but there's a paint that is actually like less toxic or they call it non-toxic where a lot of paints are pretty toxic. And this material I would hope would be life friendly, but it's hard to actually identify, right? Like what is life friendly? And so I think the emphasis is that needs to be part of the conversation when we're talking about biomimicry for sure. It's a great question. Velcro would be form focused biomimicry. Yeah. Was there another question? That's a good question. And it, I think something that we'll get into later is like when we actually start to practice biomimicry and I have worked in the startup realm and like worked with students that are getting their products to market or prototyping, prototyping their designs and trying to make them a reality. And that's a really hard stepping stone of you're trying to create something and the product, you know, manufacturing and transportation, the systems don't exist in a life-friendly way. So how do you make that a reality in the existing systems and also push back that? We, yeah, we get into that in my most recent podcast episode, actually. So I don't, I don't do a lot of self-promotion, but that was a good opportunity. Thank you. So this is another really good example of form-focused biomimicry and one that is super life-friendly in a lot of ways. They looked at how a humpback whale swims underwater and it has these weird tubercle bumps on its leading edge of its fin, which when engineers first saw this, they, you know, they were like, why is it on the leading side? That doesn't really make any sense. Um, but it does make a lot of sense. And they have these irregular bumps called tubercles that help to kind of break the water apart and make it actually way more aerodynamic or fluid dynamic um, when it swims underwater because it creates these kind of vortices in between the bumps and it helps almost propel it through the water. And so these engineers, looked at that form and mimicked it on the blades of wind turbines, making them way more efficient and able to capture more energy with less wind, which is really cool. We just think of a straight blade, make it kind of thin, it'll be aerodynamic, but it's a very similar 
um, uh, function in water of breaking up the airflow and making it more efficient. So that's a really great example of form-focused biomimicry. Another classic, which is me, you may have heard this, this is the, the big story. This was all over the news a few years ago. Um, the Shinkansen high-speed train in Japan goes over 200 kilometers an hour, and it would go through these tunnels and create a very loud sonic boom, right? It was pushing the air. It had a very flat front. So just kind of pushing the air through the tunnel, and then we have this explosion sound at the end of the tunnel, which is why it was called the bullet train, because it sounded like a bullet <laughs> for neighboring towns multiple times a day. It was a huge issue. And this engineer, who was the head of the engineer on this whole project, was actually a birder. And he noticed that the kingfisher bird, and I should have had a video of this, but they dive into the water. They have this long, narrow beak. They dive into the water without creating a splash, without a ripple. They catch the fish, and then they create a splash with their wings coming out. But the dive in is virtually splashless. And he was like, that is an interesting strategy. I wonder if that would work on the train. So they mimicked the train front, similar to the bird beak, and it totally eliminated the sonic boom and also made it go 10% faster on 15% electricity use. Super cool. They integrated a few other like nature inspired things like the pangolin um, has an interesting way of like sliding. And so they mimic that on kind of the attachment mechanisms on the top and bottom too. But yeah, looking towards nature, either totally new designs, but also retrofitting designs that we already have to make them more efficient and more life friendly is a really cool path for biomimicry. So those are all form focused, getting a little bit more into the weeds, we have process focused. So it goes form, process, system, kind of in hierarchy of, of difficulty, form being the most easy to understand. And I'm just going to talk briefly about process and systems focused because they do get a little hairy pretty quickly. But process focused is looking at a lot of chemistry. How does nature do things in nature? How does nature build materials and process materials and recycle waste? And a lot of that has to do with the, the chemistry of it. So muscles attached to rock underwater. If you've taken a walk on the coast and you've tried to get the muscles off the rock, you know they're not going anywhere. And it's mostly because they have bissel threads, which are a physical attachment. But also on the, on the ends of the bissel threads, there's these proteins that get secreted. And there's two proteins, and they have a specific order, dopa and lysine. Dopa primes the rock surface and gets it ready for attachment, kind of creates a slick surface. And lysine attaches really, really effectively to this rock. Um, and dopa is also so uh, attachment driven that it actually can attach to Teflon, which is really cool and a, a fun fact as well. So mussels have this process of attaching to rock that is underwater, that is life friendly, that is using proteins that has, you know, can totally decompose, that is so life friendly you can eat it. And we have the worst glues and adhesives ever that don't even work well underwater. So these developers are trying to understand and mimic the process of attachment for, for muscles into glues, especially glues that can work underwater when we're thinking about coral restoration. We're growing little pieces of coral and then trying to attach them underwater to other pieces of coral and they're falling apart, they're getting, you know, um, they're, they're getting sucked away by the waves, whatever it is. So we can learn a lot from how stuff attaches underwater and, and we have a lot to learn in the adhesives realm too because our adhesives are very toxic and, and can end up in ecosystems and our bodies that are that create definitely not conditions conducive to life. So that'd be an example of process focused. Getting into chemistry, which is, yeah, can be a little daunting. But that's actually what got me into biomimicry is, you know, chemistry is daunting, but I think it's just the way that we're taught chemistry. When we really start to get into how nature does chemistry, it's beautiful and elegant and inspiring and really makes you rethink, you know, why chemistry matters because chemistry is everywhere. And the last level that's kind of the hardest to mimic is systems level biomimicry and systems focused. And that's understanding how whole ecosystems work, how nutrient flows work, how waste streams work in nature. And then mimicking that into large scale systems that we have in design, like this one Kallenberg um, industrial park in Sweden or Denmark. And this industrial park really was trying to rethink how different industries would reuse and use the waste of another industry. So you can only set up shop here if you use the waste from a different company that's nearby. So it's this contained industrial park that has no waste and very few inputs because everyone's using waste, a waste stream from another um, company, which is really cool. Like, you know, like fish sludge or energy or heat or wastewater, whatever it is, they're creating and using that in their own industry and rather it being like an output or a waste stream. So systems focus is super cool. Permaculture is actually a really great example of systems focused biomimicry. How does nature in an ecosystem level function and how can we integrate that into growing food and creating a healthy system for animals and plants in our own garden? It's kind of like a small scale level of systems focused, which is very interesting. 
And then just a little bit more about how biomimicry is practiced. Before I wanna kind of get into, and this talk is mainly focused on strategies of plants, um, but in order to understand strategy, we have to understand a little bit about how biomimicry is practiced. And I think what I'm trying to do is ultimately shed light on this field that I think can seem daunting and seem confusing for many people who've heard of it once, think it's promising, but at the end of the day, like, okay, but how do I actually do this? How do I practice this? Or what does this look like when it's being practiced? And this is a great graphic that my old boss, Dana Baumeister, who is a leader in the field, she's been an educator for, you know, 25, 30 years. And she, she was right up there with um, Janine Benyus, who wrote the book on biomimicry, as far as like really starting a guideline and a curriculum for biomimicry worldwide. So that's a lot of what the master's program follows. That's what the professional program follows. That's what practitioners in biomimicry all over the world, this is how they do it. And they use circles because circles are found in nature a lot of the time instead of, you know, boxes or tables, it's like we don't, we don't need that visual. But there's three essential elements. On the left, there's a smaller circle, and that's just kind of to visualize biomimicry is more than just emulating. And emulating is what I just described. You know, you have your organic form in nature and you're mimicking it in some design. That would be emulate. But there's also ethos and reconnect. And ethos is what I was trying to hint at earlier, is the, the why. Why would we practice biomimicry? How is it important? And why is it important to integrate life-friendly design in our own world? It's the kind of moral structure of biomimicry and, and the intention of integrating um, you know, strategies from nature in a meaningful way that creates conditions conducive to life. And there's also reconnect. You are probably all familiar with reconnect. And you don't even know it yet because reconnect is our connection to nature how we relate to and interact with and understanding that we ultimately are nature and we need to go out into nature in order to be inspired by it. And spending time in nature is good for our health and well-being and productivity and inspiration levels. And so together this reconnect ethos and emulate really encapsulate biomimicry on a more holistic level than I think is what then what is talked about most of the time. So I just wanted to mention that. And then on the right, there's this bigger circle, and this is kind of the design phase of biomimicry. And we don't, we're not gonna talk about this a lot, but I just wanted to kind of visualize what this looks like. And there's a little arrow that kind of goes around starting in the scoping realm, and you, you are trying to identify function. What are you looking for in nature that you're trying to solve already? Or you know, what's in nature that you can be inspired by and, and build something based off of? And then you discover your natural models, you can abstract your biological strategies, and this gets way into the weeds and we're not gonna go into this. There's like whole master's classes on this, but I just wanted to throw it out there to kind of start to visualize there is a process for this. It's messy, it's not perfect. And that's why it's in a circle because you might go around a few times before you find a design or figure out a prototype that works similar to nature. My students spend many weeks just on abstracting biological strategies. And we're gonna talk a little a bit about that today because that's the most tricky to understand yet most crucial important aspect of biomimicry. Because when we don't accurately translate what's happening in nature, we cannot create we're already set up for failure. We can't create designs that we're inspired by and create conditions conducive to life, right? So if we get the strategy wrong and we translate it to a design that has nothing to do with nature or does not actually mimic what that plant or animal is doing in the wild, it's not ultimately biomimicry. So that's kind of the core of today's talk. This is also a really cool graphic and I realize you can't see it. So I'm just gonna talk through a little bit about this, but it sets the context really well. And something that I love about biomimicry is this feeling of humble humbleness, right? Like we are so new here in the scheme of things. We have been here for a fraction of a second. It, and, this, and this graphic is kind of the entire history of life on earth and even before life on earth into a, a calendar year. And so it's really fun because you have, you know, your January 1st, that's kind of like earth was born. It's a planet. And then you have photosynthesis arriving mid-March. So a few months later, and then you have four months until August 18th, you have multicellular organisms. So already in month eight, we're already mostly down the calendar year. We haven't even gotten to sexual reproduction or flowering plants yet. Sexual reproduction is in September. And then we have fungi, fish, land plants, and insects in November. And then in, De in December, that's kind of this blown up middle chart. We have amphibians and reptiles and mammals and birds and flowers down on December 20th. So that's a fun fact, very late in the year. And then on December 31st at 11 p.m., that's when hominids walk, very late in the year. December 31st at 12.23, humans, homo sapiens, 12.20 or 22.26. So about 
34 minutes before the end of the year. And then the industrial revolution is December 31st, 225958. Literally two seconds, half a, a 20th, a 200th of a second. <laughs> Very, very close to the end of the year. We have been here for no time at all in comparison to all of the other things we share this planet with. And they've all been through many mass extinctions, right, that have honed down even further what is able to survive and what's adapting to conditions to life on Earth. And that's where there's this moment, I think, of like, oh, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I have not been here very long at all. My elders and my ancestors on this planet are the plants and fungi and animals, and they can teach me a lot about how to live here sustainably. And I think that was what really grounds me in this practice and what I really want to share is this feeling that you might all have when you're in the garden of these plants are inspiring and they're beautiful and they, they do these things during certain parts of the year. But if we take it a step further and ask why, ask plants how they function, why they work the way they do, then we can begin to have conversations and apply those to other areas of our life. And that's where biomimicry lies in your everyday practice. And so that's just a reminder that organisms in nature have been solving the same challenges we're currently facing, but for millions of more years. And very successfully, a lot of trial and error, what hasn't succeeded is a fossil. What has succeeded still exists and is still being adapted to conditions to life on Earth. What we're experiencing now in climate chaos and increasing heat and increasing disasters and increase in storms and severity of storms, Organisms are adapting to that right now as we are, but plants and animals are also adapting to that. And in a few years, we'll be able to understand how different species are changing with the changing climate and perhaps even learn from those moments as well, even though we're also losing a lot of biodiversity in the process, which is very sad. So it sets the stage, right? We're, we're new here, we know nothing, <laughs> clean slate, everything around us has adapted to and, and has thrived on planet earth for way longer than we have. What about nature? makes it work and how can we translate that? So biomimicry, and I've, I've talked about this a little, but it requires translating the biological strategies that are happening in the natural world to design principles. And that's that abstracting design phase that was in that circle a few slides ago, right? This is the hard part. This is accurately understanding what biology is doing, what these plants are doing and translating that into a design. And my students spend a lot of time struggling with this because many of them are, many of them are designers and they have to access the research, they have to reach out to the biologists, they have to really dive deep into why these strategies work and, and how the plant or animal is using these strategies to their benefit in order to then translate those ideas. Because if we do it incorrectly, or we miss the, you know, the actual strategy and we're not ultimately mimicking what's happening in nature, again, not biomimicry. And so I'm gonna read these out loud because I realize that the slides are kind of far from you, but. The first part of that is identifying function and identifying strategy in nature. And function is kind of the why. So why do aloe leaves, why are aloe leaves the shape they are, right? If it could be, you know, protection from herbivores, it could be to capture water, it could be protection from UV, all of those would be functions, usually only a few words. And there's very few kind of categorized functions in nature, which we'll get to but there's a lot of different strategies. So strategies is the how. How do aloe leaves capture water, right? And so that for this example, it's like strategies of aloe leaves include tough waxy leaves with spines arranged in an outward conical spiral shape. And so function is why, strategy is how. And I'm gonna get into a few strategies today for different plants that are native to California that I find really interesting and really inspiring because most of the biomimicry stories we hear about are usually animals or birds or cool fungi. I don't think plants get enough love. So we're here to give plants some love and to be inspired by what some cool strategies plants are doing and potentially how we could design based off of them. And this again is a hor horrible graphic because it's really hard to see, but I basically just wanted to show you, this is the biomimicry taxonomy. And these are all kind of categorized functions. So you have your like 26 kind of main and sub functions. And this is what everything in the natural world is doing. It's capturing water, it's building materials, it's creating color, it's, it's doing everything. This is everything. Scientists over the last 20 years have really categorized and honed in on these specific functions. And then when you get to the array of beautiful strategies, that's where you see the diversity in the plants and animal in, the, in all the kingdoms we see. But there's you know, pretty categorized versions of looking at function. And I'm happy to send out this slide deck also after if anyone wants it. Um, but this is on a really cool website that I will actually kind of mention later, um, asknature.org, really great resource for biomimicry. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a few slides um, and we have our 
strategy. Um, and then we also have kind of like what, what we're inspired by, what organism in nature, what native plant are we seeing this interesting strategy in and how could we apply it would be like the next slide. So for example, big leaf maple, we have our maple seeds that are super interesting. If you've ever like played with maple seeds and dropped them, you can see they kind of have this spiral. Um, it's the shape of the maple seed that helps it get dispersed in the wind because it has this kind of small, um, thinner leading edge that catches the air drift and then it drifts through the air more efficiently than if it didn't have that kind of wind sail, literally, it would just drop to the ground. And so with this wind sail, it catches the upward drift and it floats through the air and can travel way further with even less wind. And so our strategy is like how that works. For example, the leading edge of the seed lowers the air pressure over the top of the seed, sucking the wind of the seed upwards, giving it extra lift or extra travel time. This leads to a prolonged arrival at the ground and more efficient dispersal. And I have a cool video I wanna show you too of how this works, just a brief, um, they filmed this, this research team, and you can just see how it kind of catches that air and stays in the air longer. And so the potential of this strategy is creating one of the first monocopters, which again, maybe is not like super life friendly, but we don't have a monocopter and helicopters use a lot of fuel and they have a hard time maneuvering depending on where they're going. And also just making more efficient wind turbines. We have wind turbines that work pretty well, but when there's less wind, they have a harder time capturing, capturing a lot of energy. So big leaf maple, we can learn from some of the strategies. One of my favorite species ever, 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 actually I have a tattoo of it, is the coast redwood, Sequoia sepivirens. And these trees have a ton of different strategies. So this is also something to note. One organism, one plant, one flower, one animal could have 50 different strategies for how it's surviving in its habitat, right? And we just are, for this you know, example, we're just caring about one of those strategies or potentially two of those strategies. And biomimics, when we are learning from one strategy in nature, we're just looking at one of them. We don't really look at like the 50 different strategies that plant is doing. Most of the time we care if we're trying to create a design, for example, we already have a challenge that we're trying to solve. Like I want to be able to capture water in an arid climate. And I would look at, you know, coast redwoods and other champion species that do this really effectively in, a, in the same context that I'm looking at. And that would be, um, we'd, we could get into the more of the weeds if I was doing like a full class, like many, many weeks of this. Um, but that's just an example of everything in nature is doing a lot of things, a lot of really cool things. And depending on what you're also looking for in your design, you can learn from a few of those, or maybe you're just focused on one. With the coast redwood, they have a lot of different strategies. And the one that I'm interested in is their ability to capture fog and use it as water in their, in their roots. So they have these high surface area leaves all over the tree, but mostly at the top and they spread out and the fog kind of drips on them and then drips down to the ground and the roots soak up the water. And this also, is they're able to survive longer drier months in the summer because they're just using fog instead of a lot of rainwater. And there's companies that are mimicking this fog capture technology in areas like Chile that do have fog condensation but have a lot of like water deprivation and drought conditions to capture water and they're able to capture a ton of water on these fog surfaces and use it in their town which is really cool. Also like localized water instead of shipping water really far distances or desalination, which has a bunch of issues. But yes, learning from the coast redwood and other species that harvest fog in these microstructures and using nets to capture water in areas that have less available fresh water. Basically anything in the cactus family we can learn from for drought tolerance. There's a ton of different species in Southern California that has these thick ridges that provide self-shading depending on the time of day and also the spines, which help to control airflow and manage like a constant temperature, usually cooler around the plant because hot air kind of comes up and out of these channels and then the shade helps keep the cactus cooler. So it's able to you know, prevent excess water loss. It's able to get shading throughout the day and ultimately survive in these really harsh conditions. We need to be able to learn from plants like this that are doing it effectively in a desert ecosystem. I just moved from Phoenix and we definitely weren't doing this but you're seeing we're seeing it kind of a rise in architecture like this building in Qatar that is inspired by many different cactuses this one's not built yet and this is verging on what I would call like 
showcasing biomimicry, but we haven't actually seen what it's built and what it's built with and how it's built. So to be determined, but this is a good example of learning from cactuses and potentially retrofitting designs too, with these shading structures on the exterior of the building that can provide shade during different times of the day and also like lower the AC cost and potentially also capturing energy from the sun during different phases of that. But also cactuses are just super, super amazing on many different levels and have of a array of strategies that all have to do with capturing water and preventing water loss and also reducing exposure to UV light. And this is an interesting one with glow kids that kind of help prevent moisture loss and at the same time, even have a moisture harvesting capabilities because they're this collection. And this is a, a bad image because it's very sciencey, <laughs> but it's from a publication and they're looking at how water droplets kind of land on these really tiny spines, you know, atmospheric water, ideally, um, or ultimately. And then they're kind of channeled down to the middle of the glochid and then they're absorbed by the plant. And it's this tiny collection of spines that we wouldn't really think much of, but that little collection of spines has a lot to teach us for how we can start to capture water on different levels or potentially like bring it to scale and apply it to different areas. And even solar evaporation, like using different structures to collect evaporative water and then use that, use structures to collect the evaporation that, that condenses um, in different structures. So I don't have a picture of that, but fog collection in areas that does have fog, but also areas that don't have fog in arid regions, we can use structures like glow kids and apply that to different design realms. So these are just some examples of like what this could look like in design. This is one of my favorites. Um, sunflowers are very interesting, very beautiful. And if you've ever taken a closer look at the sunflower seed head, you'll know that they have a very specific arrangement of seeds. And in nature, we call this the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio. And it's basically, I like to describe it as you're growing, but staying the same shape which is I think an easier way to say in like a lot of the mathematician formulas, but it's a certain angle and it has to do with like maximizing space efficiency and packing and related to like snail shells and even Nautilus shells, our inner ear has a Fibonacci sequence. It's kind of you're growing and you're adding more to the system, but you're staying the same shape, which is a really good way of explaining that. They also follow the path of the sun throughout the day. They're heliotropic, so they will kind of move depending on the location of the sun. And these two strategies have a lot to teach us for what we could do to maximize solar efficiency and build solar fields that potentially take up less space. We can pack in more solar array with, with less land use, and then also potentially follow the track of the sun instead of just having them in one place. And then we're you know at the whim of wherever the sun is. And if you don't get sun, we can have solar. So this is another great image. And these will all be better like if I send that out the, the PDF, but um, you know, you have this specific angle. The two on the left are kind of the golden angle plus or minus one degree. And you can see how it would change the shape of the seed packing. But on the farthest right on the image, that's the golden ratio or the golden angle. And the, the seeds are all distributed. And you start to see this beautiful pattern, this beautiful geometric pattern arise. And it really has to do with efficiency, right? Something is growing after the next thing already grew and it's growing at a slightly different angle in order to maximize the efficiency of the entire system. So nature's figured it out, right? We're, we're trying to reinvent the wheel. We are designing really incredible stuff. But at the end of the day, there's these very simple, beautiful, elegant strategies in nature that we can learn from to create a more life-friendly future here on earth. And so there's actually engineers that are inspired by this currently designing a solar field that's kind of concentrating the amount of solar energy they're able to capture and they're using 20 percent less land use than traditional or the same area would of a other um, solar energy field and then i have a few slides i'm almost i'm going to wrap up here soon for some questions but i'm i have a few slides that don't have um, potential ideas yet but i'm very inspired by these different strategies so the horsetail which is equisetum um, is one of my favorite plants just because it's so weird looking. It's very like Jurassic. You go out and see it and you're like, whoa, where are the dinosaurs? Super interesting plant. And the, the tiny um, structures on the top of their, their um, spore distributors are called elaters. I might have pronounced that wrong, but they disperse their spores by coiling and uncoiling in response to humidity. So this very tiny structure that doesn't require any energy to disperse, but it just re like responds to the humidity of the atmosphere. And there's a lot of potential in that, um, um, forget the name of the plant that also does. There's another really famous plant that does that with their seeds. And I'm gonna remember it in a little bit once I'm 
Yes, that one. And also, uh, <laughs> I totally forget. It's a desert plant. Um, I will remember it later, maybe when someone's asking me a question. But they kind of coil and uncoil, and their system has a lot of different mechanisms. But we drill, and we have technology for dis like dispersal that re usually requires a lot of energy or a lot of input or potentially a lot of waste output, like fossil fuels or carbon dioxide. And engineers are really looking for um, these humidity change responses strategies in nature to understand how we could implement them in different you know, opening mechanisms and different drilling mechanisms that don't require any energy and are rather a response to its atmospheric conditions. So next time you see a horsetail with the little spore dispersal head, you gotta check it out. The elaters are very small, but interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like you mentioned the other plant, there's, there's a lot of species that do that and a lot of spore dispersal strategies that have to do with humidity changes. And that's another, they were mentioning the, the distinction between seeds that, and we actually were looking at one in the bot garden today, where they just like use pressure. And then when the pressure builds to a certain degree and the seeds are big enough, it like forces the, the, its opening. And there's a lot of seed dispersal strategies like that too. Um, and so as, we, as we've experienced, and you've probably come across many different seed dispersal strategies, um, a colleague of mine just had a really great uh, exhibit at ASU a few years ago where she was looking at a ton of different seeds and they used macro photography. She had this professional professional photographer to take these incredible up close photos of tiny, tiny seeds and then blow like blew them up to like five feet by six feet. It was so beautiful. And you're really able to see the structure of these seeds in a new way. And it's literally called seeds and it's in a magazine somewhere now because it was so beautiful and well done. And she wrote about all these different seed dispersal mechanisms. And the one that I'm talking about, that's the desert species that I'm gonna remember later, or I'll look it up. But it has a seed tip and then a long extended kind of tail. And the tail is what changes shape, but it lands on the ground. And then there's this video of the tail opening and closing and coil and drilling itself into the ground with no energy besides humidity. So that's a really great example. It's not native to California. Storksbill, that's what it is, Storksbill seeds. Um, and, and that's a really cool strategy too. There's a great video on that. So a few more strategies, only I think there's two more of these, but a lot of desert plants and drought tolerant plants also have these kind of hairy exo or like coatings. And I'm fascinated by this because I think there's a ton of different functions that this one strategy is accomplishing. Could be preventing water loss, could be protecting from UV, which is I think a major one because you're living in harsh straight sun, having a little extra exterior, hairy exterior to disperse those light rays really helps protect the inner softer water containing parts. And we see it a lot in a lot of different drought tolerant plants. So I'm throwing this up there as like, pay attention to the hairy plants because I think there's more going on there. There's not a ton of research around it as far as like how we can apply that to design, but there's definitely areas where we can integrate this like really efficient UV protecting water loss preventing strategy in different design ideas. So just something to like spark your inspiration next time you're out there, maybe planting some California milkweed for the, for the bees or butterflies. And then one of my other favorite plants that's not necessarily found up here, but we had a lot of it in Arizona and it's very heavy in Southern California, all the different choya species. Um, we don't often see what they look like inside, which is the image on the right. Um, but we see on the outside, they can grow really tall and they're pretty skinny. They're, you know, a fist width maybe. And some of the choya in Arizona that are, you know, they can get up to like nine or 10 feet tall. They're really tall. And the inside looks like the image on the right. They have this integrated holes, like in the middle of their, um, the material that, that like is creating the entire plant. And so when we think of holes, we think of a material we create and then we drill holes and then those little holes are waste, right? There, we had to drill a hole, we used energy and now there's a waste product. But nature integrates the holes into the, build, at, into the building as it's building it. So there's no waste product. And also there's research that's coming out that has very much proven that these integrated holes allows for greater torsional toughness. So they're able to withstand these windstorms and hurricane force like gales in Southern California and especially in Arizona, like the Sonoran Desert gets a lot of summer storms. And these choya just kind of bend with the wind and they have this torsional toughness and flexibility and strength 
and maximum strength with minimum material use. That's another really interesting strategy in nature that we can learn from because we use so much material and it's still not that strong or it's very brittle. It breaks very often. Then we have to rebuild it with more. So really rethinking how does nature build strong materials with less energy and less use of original material? And Choya is super cool. And if you ever see them laying on the ground in the desert, I actually have one or two hanging in my living room because I consider that decoration. It's super beautiful and weird looking and everyone always asks me what it is. And it's the inside of a Choya, it's so cool. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here, but I also wanted to share this really incredible website. It's called asknature.org. It's, I don't like comparing things to Google, but it's kind of like the Google for biomimicry. There's a search bar. If you click up on the, see on the right-hand corner, they just redid it, which I'm not a big fan of, but on the upper right-hand corner, there's a bar that says search. You can click search and literally type in to the search bar, how does nature create color? How does nature disperse seeds? And it will give you hundreds and thousands of examples of biological models in nature that are doing that function and that strategy that you're searching for. And then also there's a whole tab of innovations and companies that are learning from nature and applying it really effectively. So a lot of those examples I gave are on Ask Nature. There's hundreds more. You can search by innovation or biological strategy and get a collection and you can see the functions and it's just organized really well. I have a podcast episode on it, which I'm also gonna plug because I explain all of this in the podcast episode with the chief editor of asknature.org and he explains it even better than I can. And he has a really interesting pathway into biomimicry too of um, just being a, like a biologist and having kind of this paleontology or uh, background and being excited about like kingdoms and phyla and organizing structures and organisms in nature. Um, so yes, learning from nature is my podcast. I have an episode on ask nature, which is asknature.org. Write that down. It's one of the best websites out there for biomimicry. I love it so much and use it constantly uh, in teaching and just being inspired. For example, this equisetum, I was, you know, I was like, I really like horsetail. What does horsetail do? I, I searched and ask nature. I was like, horsetail and this came up and there's a whole research paper that's linked to this page about people that are learning from these you know the structures that carry spores and how they distribute spores so it's all in ask nature i highly recommend it it's a great launching point i think another great tool for really get diving deep into biomimicry is starting to read those research papers and even if it's just looking at the figures or looking at the end discussion or the conclusion Diving deep into what the biologists are finding out firsthand is a really great way to then take that learning in your own practice. And when you go out into nature, you'll have a little bit more kind of structure and info and background into why stuff in nature works the way it does. Which is again, I think, and I, I could have started off with this too. I think I'm definitely a generalist and I love this because as a natural historian and biomimic, I know a little bit about a lot of stuff. And that is what I love. I go on a walk with my friends and we spend an hour going half a mile because we're looking at all the cool stuff. I'm pointing out how things function or like questions about why this plant has a certain structure. And this curiosity that biomimicry brings is so refreshing and so inspiring to everybody, no matter the background or interest or field or discipline. And that's especially why I like going on biomimicry walks with faculty in vastly different depart departments than me, because we get to nerd out on nature and connect over this common interest and then apply it to our own fields in different ways and sometimes the same way. And it's just really inspiring and motivating because biomimicry applies to every field and every discipline. I'll just end with this quote and I'll, I'll save some time for Q&A too. So the more our world functions like the natural world, the more likely we are to endure on this home that is ours, but not ours alone. It's a good reminder from Janine, who is um, seen as like the mother of biomimicry. She wrote the book on biomimicry in the late eight, or late nineties and runs the consulting firm that they have. And she's a beautiful speaker. If you have time, watch her Ted talk. It's like one of the most watched Ted talks on the internet is Janine Benius's Ted talk on biomimicry from like 2002. Um, and it, she just speaks about it really beautifully. A lot of the innovations have changed since then, but the message is the same, right? This is not a new way of thinking. It's a very old way of thinking, but it's a new way we can start to integrate what's happening in the natural world and apply it to every discipline. And in fact, we need to, right? We, we need to start being able to learn from nature and take clues and being able to revolutionize how we build things based on the way nature does it. Because nature has been doing it way, way longer. Thank you all. We got plenty of time for questions, I think, right? If anyone has questions. Oh yes, Zoom people, questions. <laughs> 
mycelium. So it's like they integrate spores and mycelium into a material. I think it's called, I have it listed on the slides. Um, yeah, mycelium and spores. And it's the company called Eco, Ecovative Mushroom Packaging. And I can actually read from my notes here. It says, using hemp herd, which is a byproduct of the hemp industry as kind of like the base, but then also mixing it with mycelium and spores or not spores, but mycelium and letting them mycelium grow into the structure of the hemp herd to create the form that they want. That's a great question. And Ecovative I have listed on, on my notes in this document too, which I'm happy to share if anyone wants them. Any other questions? Is there an extra plant or animal, I will assume, that I'm extra excited about right now? And that's a hard question to answer because I'm excited about lots of things. But recently I've been obsessed with and very interested in fungal networks in the forest. And I did my master's thesis on researching old growth forest communication, which is often found in the mycelial networks and fungal networks in forests, connecting the trees and the plants and how they're warning each other of pests or capturing water or potentially preparing for drought in a way that's uh, way beyond anything we can even comprehend. They're actually starting to network and map and listen to the fungal networks and forests, which is mind blowing to me. Um, but I built a startup based off of fungal mycel mycelium networks and applying those strategies to human communication networks during and after natural disasters. So I think there's a lot to be said about learning from efficient communication in fungal networks in the forest, in old growth fungal networks, so we can't be cutting them down. And we don't even know, know all, of the, all of what they're doing or how they're doing it, but being able to read those research papers and understand what's happening and then translating it to human communication, especially around disaster planning, preparedness, and response. But yes, fungus. Every time I see a mushroom, like even today, which if you, if you want to see the mushroom, you can come up and, and ask me, but we saw a really incredible mushroom in the botanic gardens that had this geometric, it was like one of the open ones that had the geometric outer side kind of smelled like rotting flesh and it had flies on it and it was orange and I've never seen one of those and I just got down on my hands and knees and was taking videos um, you know there's a whole network that's vast that's connecting all of these different organisms under the earth that we can't even see but being able to see a mushroom I think is like whoa it's a reminder that it's there yeah so the question was those structures that I showed early on in Singapore that's like the, the walking path that looks like trees that I gave some hate on that maybe I didn't need to hate on it so much because it is beautiful and to a certain degree they're learning from organic growth forms in nature to create a structure that's stronger potentially with less material use but then yeah I think a lot of the point is like what materials are they using where are they shipping it from does it actually function like a tree would and maybe one of the answers is yes it functions in the structural integrity but maybe not in the other in the other factors so I'll, I'll have to find a worse example <laughs> of, of biomorphism yeah, so she was saying that nature doesn't have to fly in materials from other countries and ship stuff around the world or make materials on, in one end of the state and then ship them and make them the actual product in the other end of the state and then ship it to wherever. And I think that's a big part of biomimicry. And we got to a little bit of that early on is like our systems that exist for making and creating and shipping and everything are rooted in this industrial system of extraction and globalization and make as much as you can with the cheapest material and that I think biomimicry disrupts that in a really way in a way that's very uncomfortable for many people in those industries and that's what's exciting but also very daunting because it's hard to get products to market that push past those systems and that's a lot of the conversation I'm having with some colleagues in the prototype and design realm it's like how do we disrupt these systems in a way that's meaningful that creates systems for future biomimicry design but how do we actually get it done in the next 20 years? So yeah, it's, it's true. Nature you know, uses local materials and chemistry that it uses water as a solvent at ambient temperature with no extra pressure. And that's where green chemistry and like how nature does chemistry is really interesting because nature does everything it needs to do very life-friendly with all of these you know, principles that I mentioned while not destroying its habitat in the meantime. Because <laughs> it can't, otherwise it wouldn't survive. Yeah, great questions. Anything else? Thank you. That means a lot. I, I started that in January, kind of in this, this 
phase of, I feel like I have a huge network and they're all doing vastly different things, but it's really important to this field. How do I share what they're doing and start conversations in different areas and make this mat like material and information more accessible, I think to, to way more people than normally would and just getting it out there. At, so, at some point I was like, well, someone will make this podcast or someone will do it. And I don't know if I'm qualified enough to, but I'm like, I, I am fully qualified. I have the network. I have the tools to do this. I've been told I have an okay podcasting voice. So I think we're good to go. And yeah, I've, I've gotten some really great feedback and I have, you know, I think it's like over 2,500 downloads now. I'm like, whoa, okay. People like biomimicry and they care about it and they want to hear professionals in the field who are practicing it in different realms, which I think is a, a really cool part of the podcast. So thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> the first one's way shorter. It's like 20 minutes. And I just, I talk through a lot of the same kind of stuff, giving examples, what is and what's not biomimicry. And then the last few episodes, I've just been interviewing people in different realms in biophilia and systems thinking and kind of like how super organisms in nature work, like ant colonies and termites and bee colony, like how they function and how we can inspire business and systems like that. So Yes, I am a big fan. They only come out every month. So there's only a few of them. I set the bar really low because I'm doing so many projects right now, but every month there'll be a new episode. I have five now, yeah. Thank you guys so much. This was so fun.